Welcome to this lecture on coastal realignment and lagoon restoration, Geltinger Berg. This is meant as a coastal management case study. My name is Gerhard Czarnewski. I am head of the Coastal and Marine Management Group at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, Germany. At the same time, I am professor at Kleipeda University. So where is Geltinger Berg located? You see it on the right-hand side. It is at the Baltic Sea coast in Schleswig-Holstein, close to the Danish border. And it is a kind of peninsula, a spit that traps a lowland moor. And the total area is about 10 square kilometers. It has a long development. Originally in the medieval, there were several islands that were pushed to the coast. At the same time, the spit expanded and this meant that lagoons were in the 20th century finally trapped. Already in the medieval, the Geltinger Berg area was used as settling place. And in 1581, a first simple dike tried to protect the lagoon area from Baltic Sea inundations. At that time, the area was largely covered by forests and used for hunting. In 1821 and the following uh, years, this dike was strengthened because large areas were used for agriculture, potatoes, cereals, and other fruits. And reed harvesting uh, played an important role. But in 1872, we had the highest storm surge ever recorded in the Baltic Sea. And this caused inundations, high inundations. So the water level was 3.2 meters above uh, zero. And as a consequence, a serious long dike was built with a length of 10 kilometers about. In the 1930s, parts of the area already became nature protection area and agricultural use increased. And this meant draining became more intensive. Between 1945 and the 70s, the forests were largely lost and the cropland was transformed into pasture. Problem was that at that time already, the lowland moor was about three meters below the sea level. And at that time, the nature protection area was expanded as well. So this is how it looked like. On the spit side, the sandy spit, the dike, and in the interior drained uh, wetland. As I said, three meter below sea level. And this is how it looked like. Already in uh, the 80s, it was largely nature protected area and was used because of its attractiveness for recreation. But in the 1970s, a series of storm surges occurred. There was a dike breach, repair costs of 2.8 million euros. So that first considerations took place about a rewetting of the lowland moor and a coastal realignment, so to give up the area. And in the next decade, more storm surges caused dike breaches. There was a provisorical 
Solution with gabions, cages filled with rock. And in 1990, two scenarios were developed. So either strengthening and uh, increasing the height of the dike towards the Baltic Sea, or giving it up and accepting an partly inundation of the lowland. Idea was to keep the lowland inundated up to one meter below sea level, so a controlled inundation. In 2002, they tried to keep the landscape semi-open and introduced wild horses, the Konigs, and cattle, Galloway. This is how it looked like, so they were more or less meant as landscapers and made the area attractive. They finally decided to go for the second solution, to accept a flooding, a controlled flooding. This meant the existing digs had to be filled and a new one had to be built, as shown here in the picture. The old drainage mill, Charlotte, was preserved and protected and it ended with a situation shown on this picture. So in 2008, the new dike protecting only the town of Pfalzhöft was finished. The new water barrage controlling the water level was finished as well. So that in 2013, in test flooding could take place. And on the picture, the yellow areas are above sea level. The dark blue areas are more or less permanently inundated and the green-blue areas are temporary inundated. This is how it looked in 2013, the test inundation. So large water areas occurred. And this is the situation uh, today, the re-establishment of the lagoon system. So, a long story, and it took a long time. And I'd ju just like to give you a brief overview about how this was perceived by locals and reflected in media. So, in 80, 1987, already, the Green Environmental Minister declared publicly the concept of a dike opening and a flooding. This was picked up by local newspapers, first neutrally. Um, later, they took the side of the local population, a critical side. The local parties were divided into supporters and opponents of these measures. And one of the local landowners called the entire project Wish of a Dreamer. As a consequence of the resistance, landowners and the mayors formed an initiative against it. At the same time, there was this dike breach and the green supporters, the NGOs, were not happy that the gap was filled provisorically at high costs with uh, gabions. So there was a clear conflict. And even the church became opponent and saw God's creation at risk. And um, even against the new small and high dike, there was resistance because people wanted to keep free view uh, to the sea. But they lost a, a lawsuit and in the 1990s, everything calmed down a bit. 
there were several compromises, especially with respect to the accessibility of the area. So this just shall show you how difficult the start was and that this was followed by a very slow implementation process with many conflicts and several compromises. How does it look like today? So we have an improved infrastructure to ensure the accessibility. 15 kilometers of walking paths, a nature protection information and exhibition center, a kiosk, info stands, and local people offer guided tours. The picture is given impression of it. Especially the visitor guidance system was new and innovative and the attraction are 200 bird species, 90 of them resting birds and of course the Galloways and the wild horses, the Konix. We carried out an evaluation how uh, tourists and visitors perceive the areas. Is it a difference to the view of the local people who were skeptical? And I will make a long story short. The acceptance of the implemented measure, so the final result in 2013, was perceived very positively and it really became a tourism attraction and especially the established tourism infrastructure and the guidance system has to be regarded as very uh, successful. If we now have a uh, concluding look at the strengths of this approach. So this was an innovative concept, an integrated coastal realignment together with a nature protection solution. It covered a relatively large area, 10 square kilometers, and it was cost effective. The purchase of the land reduced conflicts. And there were always several local driving people who did show a high persistence and were at the end trusted. So the locals had um, a contact point. There was a readiness to go for compromise and to accept compromises. And very important was the establishment of the information center as an address for concerns. From an engineering point of view, this was very successful. Everything worked well. And during the late planning and implementation process, public meetings and the information campaigns worked well from the mid-90s to the 2000s. It became a successful tourism attraction. And today we can say that even the local people who were formerly against it are now very positive about the final result. And the media coverage is positive as well. The weaknesses. So in the beginning, late 80s, there was a lack of systematic information, a poor participation strategy, a lot of misunderstandings, negative media coverage, and this hampered the planning, and a strong polarization between parties and green supporters and some local people. Problem was that it took a long time. The actors changed. The people politically in charge changed. And what remained until uh, 2000s, that they were single opponents against the project, but they very much followed their own agenda. They had a personal, very personal mission against this scheme. Today, the situation 
is relatively positive, but there is still a struggle for funding to cover maintenance costs in the area, to fund complementing research. Because one weakness became aware only later, that in the beginning there were not clearly defined ecological objectives. So what shall be reached in the area? And therefore, a critical evaluation, whether it is a positive case study from an ecological point of view, is very difficult. But the weakest point, or the strongest weakness, is the long period. Planning and implementation took about 25 years. So is this a coastal management best practice case study? And if you have a look at the picture, one can say, well, the final result is successful, is a positive example. But the process, certainly not. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.